I love farming. It's a wonderful enterprise. And what I love about it is its diversity. For instance, the region of the country or the types of products being produced on a farm. In today's show, we focus on different farms and what makes them so unique. We're starting off with a California girl that turned her farm dreams into a reality in Arkansas. I'm a first generation farmer. My parents are urban computer folk, but I always wanted to farm. I've always been keenly aware of the way that we interact with nature and we eat all day long, every day. There are a couple of factors that make our hogs unique. We've brought together a variety of different heritage breed pigs and then selected them now over 10 generations. And then the other exciting component of our pigs is the way that we raise them. Traditionally, pigs were raised in communities just like this, natural woodlands across the southeast. Everything that the animals interact with affects not just the quality of their lives, but the quality of the finished product. When they're eating wholesome, diverse, and healthy forages, that's also imbuing the actual flavors in the meat. This is some of our existing woodlands on the farm, which is a space that we're cultivating for specific trees. We want trees that are gonna drop some kind of high nutritional forage. Cultures all over the world have figured this out. In Italy, we hear about prosciutto, which is acorn or sometimes chestnut or hazelnut finished pigs. In the south, we call it country ham. In our region, a lot of the wild nuts and fruits include acorns, pecans, hickories. There's a long tradition of associating premium quality meats with a very naturalistic lifestyle of the pig. And that's what we're seeking not only to recreate, but see if we can even take it a step further in terms of the holistic sense of the farm. Good for us, maximum goodness for them, maximum meat quality. When you're farming, you don't ever go home from work. I, I live at work, which is fantastic because I open my eyes in the morning and right outside my window sometimes are my cattle grazing. But that also means that the work is never finished. But I absolutely love the life that I get to have because of it. Still to come on Garden Style, a Nashville urban farm that's doing great things in their community. Just look at all this beautiful arugula. Mm, and it tastes so good. You know, I'm very inspired by the Nashville Food Project. It's a group that brings people together to grow, cook, and share nourishing food. We believe that our current food system isn't working for the most vulnerable residents in Nashville and around the country. We really would love to have people take ownership of their own food, be it with our help or with somebody else that we've trained or helped out along the way. We're intensely focused on our local community, so we want to make sure that every Nashvilleian who wants to grow their own food has a place to do so, who wants a good quality meal is able to access that good quality meal and is able to do so in community and not in isolation. We manage five garden sites around Nashville uh, with different focuses. Some of them are production gardens that feed into our Hot Meals program. Others are community gardens where people grow food for themselves and their families. And others are market gardens where people are growing food to sell at market for supplemental income for their families. Dealing with the huge quantities of food that comes in here is one of our biggest tasks day to day. Um, we not only get stuff from the gardens, but we're also getting huge numbers of donations, um, thousands and thousands of pounds a week. It would probably be easier to just go buy stuff, um, but we have uh, meals that are done really cheaply so that we can serve them for free. Um, I think last month our meal cost was 18 cents a meal. Um, so a lot of the food that's grown comes into our kitchens and we think that that's the highest quality food that you can possibly get and that's what we want everybody to have access to. 
Our volunteers are actually the backbone um, behind all of our garden programs. We have hundreds of volunteers in our programs every month, thousands over the course of the year, and they do everything from pulling weeds to cooking meals to delivering those meals and serving them off trucks. I started volunteering about one year ago and I couldn't stop coming back. You get to develop a lot of skills that you might not be able to. I work in an office, so getting to chop food all day and learn about culinary skills is completely a brand new thing for me. Um, and I think it just makes you feel good. You find out that you donated thousands of meals a week to people who wouldn't maybe get to eat these foods otherwise, and it makes you feel good. We provide all of the tools necessary for them to get the job done. We also kind of instruct them and give them background knowledge because a lot of people don't really have a lot of garden knowledge. But honestly, they provide the workforce. Without our volunteers, we honestly would not have beautiful gardens that we do have. We work with different populations of people. Um, we try to focus on people that are immediately in the neighborhood or also kind of use some of the resources that are in the area. So maybe we have some parents that come in that go to the, their children go to the elementary school that is down the street, or we have some people that maybe use the community center. So anybody who's walking by can just take a stroll through our garden, pick some flowers, pick some herbs. And we wanna make sure that it's welcoming to everybody in the neighborhood. So we have signs that are in English. We also have signs that are in Bhutanese. We try to put signs that are in Spanish as well, just to try to make sure that everybody is able to identify what herb or what flower is in the garden and be able to pick anything that they would like. Hunger in and of itself is not the problem. It's being hungry and alone and not able to get the resources you need to feed yourself and your family. So that's why every one of our meals, every one of our gardens comes alongside a healthy dose of community. At the three different community gardens, one of them is focused primarily on immigrants and refugees from Burma or Myanmar. Um, another garden focuses on people from Bhutan. And then the third garden focuses on people from Western and Central Africa. And so a lot of the time what we're doing there is really just supporting those gardeners, um, not so much with agricultural knowledge because they are great growers, um, but more so just providing them with land and space and the tools to grow the vegetables that they love. The ultimate goal of this organization, I think, is to create community um, and food is something that everybody shares, uh, whether it's growing food together, prepping food together, what they're doing here, um, cooking food, everything that we're sharing as well is trying to, we're trying to do that in a community setting. Stay tuned for my tips for using grow lights. coming along great. Hey, have you ever tried to grow some seedlings in your house and maybe they didn't go so well? Well, I've had the same experience and it's all about the light. You want to get the light right. So you can see these little broccolini are coming along beautifully and it's because they're getting an additional light that emulates nature. So an incandescent bulb or other types of light in your house, even light from a window isn't going to be as good as some of these grow lights and they come in different forms you can get a light like this where it can just be clamped right over the plants which works really well but again it's all about that bulb or one that's elongated and you can see you can go across the entire tray these bulbs emulate the sun they emulate nature and the plants well they really respond to it now let's talk about proximity, proximity of the lights to the plants. What you want is the light to be about two to three inches above these little seedlings. And as they grow, just raise the light up just a little bit. That's ideal for these little guys to continue to grow and be strong so you can eventually transplant them outdoors in the garden. Now you're probably asking yourself just how much light should these little guys have? Well, I'm glad you asked. They need about 15 to 16 hours of sunlight. And just like us, they need a little sleepy time. 
about six hours of darkness. But you may be thinking, well, how am I gonna manage that? Well, you can actually pick up a little timer like this. I know it looks complicated, but it's really pretty easy. Light will come on, give them their 15 hours they need, go off, they can sleep, comes back on, and you get that cadence that feels like nature. And then you wanna consider temperature. You don't want it too hot, you don't want it too cold. I know it sounds like Goldilocks, but you know, the bottom line is, the temperature in your home, if you're comfortable, they're comfortable. Keep them away from drafty areas. And when it comes to moisture, just make sure that the soil is consistently moist. You don't want them to dry out and you don't want them to sit in water. Remember this transition from if you're comfortable, you can begin to move them out and get them planted in the garden and enjoy a lovely harvest throughout the growing season. Start spreading the newspaper, how to make biodegradable pots after the break. Do you have newspapers lying around that need to be put to work? You might create some of our biodegradable planting pots. They're easy to make and they work really well. Urban Farm in Dallas is changing diets and lives. Stay tuned. There are many food deserts in our country, and many of them occur in booming metropolitan areas where produce is actually hard to find. In Dallas, Texas, for instance, the Bonton Farm is working to ensure that healthy, fresh food is within reach. Nobody comes here, but due to this farm, everybody's coming here, and it's crazy. I got introduced to Bonton meeting with men, mostly that were coming out of prison, and uh, a group of men like me would come down on Saturday mornings, and we'd meet just to encourage them. After a few months of doing that, it, it kind of occurred to me that we're there for two hours on a Saturday. Who's there walking with them when we're not there? So I left my job and sold my house and moved here, really not knowing what more to do, but that I needed to be here with them to try to help them on that journey. He quit a $30 billion equity company where he was making well over $400,000 a year 
and move right down the street in the hood. When you live in a neighborhood or a community, you see things differently than when you volunteer. About 70% of the men over 25 in our community have already been to prison. And all of them said, if there's anything you can do to help, it would be jobs. And so I made a deal with the guys to start just, hey, let's start working together. Let's build a resume. Immediately, I started having guys call in sick. And I'm like, you know, I know I'm not from here, but I also wasn't born last night. This is ridiculous. But the reality was they were sick. They were in dialysis chairs having their blood sucked out and cleaned and pumped back in three times a week. And it was everywhere. Something was drastically wrong. And I, I had no idea what it was and started asking questions and learned that Bonton's a food desert. When you have a large community in the urban city that do not have access to fresh healthy food and they got to travel over a mile to the nearest grocery store, it's considered a food desert. Our nearest grocery store here in Bonton is actually three miles. You might be thinking, what's the big deal? Jump in your car, ride to the grocery store. But the average income here is 12, to 14,000, as you know, that's way below the poverty level, right? Therefore, six to seven, six to eight percent of us do not have our own vehicle. And we have to depend on transportation in the form of a bus. Can you imagine catching a bus to a grocery store three miles? It's a three hour journey. For 25 cents, I can get a bag of chips. And for 25 cents, I can get a sugar soda water. That's a meal right there. And as a result of eating like that, which most of us did around here, uh, we doubled the city rates of Dallas when it comes to heart disease, heart attack, stroke, sugar diabetes, cancer, childhood obesity. I just think that's incredibly wrong, that we have communities, impoverished communities like this in our cities around the country. I think about these kids trying to go to school and get an education, and all day, every day, all they have to eat is a honey bun and a Mountain Dew on their way to school, and then they get a little school lunch, and because of poverty, many times they won't eat again until they go back to school. Well, how am I gonna be a successful student? So if you think about that, how, how that plays out to the adults in our community, all of that lost productivity and the impact that that has on our society, these communities like this have so much to offer our world, and a lot of it's snuffed out in large part because we just don't have food. We decided to plant a garden so these men could have some work to do during the day and then they could take the food home at night and eat it. And somehow that captured the attention of this city. Uh, people from all over started to come down and see this little garden in the hood. Three years ago, I was at ground zero because the choices I had made. I had been to the penitentiary twice. I had like eight different drug habits and my life was just a hot mess, you know. I agreed to go over to Darren's house. I got to see the garden, and I got to see people that were from the neighborhood that used to be like notorious in the streets. People that was like me, you know, and these guys had been transformed. You know, they had a better life. This place is special. It's a safe haven. Not only do I have kids eating vegetables, I got them eating it in the purge form, right? A big part of our work is to help restore people, and it just so happens that growing food is a great way to help people. He's just like a regular guy, you know what I'm saying? But he brought about all this change, man. Well, this place is more than just a farm. It's a sanctuary to me. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. Well, in today's show, we've seen that you don't have to be born into a farming family to be a farmer. There's so many different types of farms. If you like to escape the office and spend your days outdoors, farmer's life might be just for you. Thanks for watching. I'm Alan Smith.